afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this episode of In the Node, brought to you by the team at Kaspersky. Ransomware, not a term that most of our audience is unfamiliar with. It was a period of time that some researchers were kind of writing it off as a predominant vector of attack. But in the recent past, things have changed. Today, we'll be discussing ransomware, which is both a timely, but also a slightly tricky topic. In 2000 alone, or so rather in 2020 alone, it's emerged that two thirds of ransomware based attacks were based on a model called ransomware as a service or ransomware as a corporation. In fact, our research tells us that in 2020 within the United States, nearly 2,300 ransomware attacks were launched in a similar model against governments, hospitals, and even education facilities. Now, when you take into account the fact that ransomware payouts and payments have increased by 104%, it really isn't much of a surprise that ransomware, especially ransomware as a service, is growing as a very interesting mode of attack. What's even more interesting is the evolution of this space, where we're beginning to hear about items such as a VC ecosystem for ransomware, a system where you're seeing developers and affiliates work together to launch attacks. So today, for this timely, albeit tricky topic, we've got you the subject of ransomware for hire. And I invite you to enjoy this session over the next one hour, drop in your questions and meet with some of our panelists as they walk through numerous facets of this concept of ransomware for hire. My name is Ali Hirji. I lead the Center for Cybersecurity Innovation at Durham College, and I'm your moderator and host for this session. I'm joined by four esteemed panelists who have much to offer on this subject, and without any further ado, I'm going to go into introducing each one of them. Firstly, the only Canadian food along the side with me on this session, Andrea from SoftChoice, who's a cloud evangelist and someone who knows quite a lot of not just thinking about security, but acting on it. Andrea from SoftChoice, thank you for joining us. Please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your superpowers in cybersecurity. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me this afternoon. My name is Dre Knoblauch, and I'm one of the agnostic security architects here at SoftChoice. And my role is basically to help uh, organizations all across Canada uh, figure out how do we get ahead of all these advanced threats, uh, depending on their unique situations. Absolutely. And I think these advanced threats and the unique situations is something we're going to unpack as we go forward. I know it's getting busy at the border, but I'm going to take the Kaspersky Express plane and head into the United States first to. Uh, the concrete jungle where dreams are made of. New York City, we have Andre from Lifers. Andre, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what brings you to this session today? Andre, real quick introduction. Ali, really thank you for having me. And my role is primarily to assist cyber victims who had been in attack, for example, by ransomware and, or other nation state threat actors. I perform digital forensic investigations uh, remediation, containment, and eradication of these threat actors from uh, most of the victims. We also heavily cooperate with the federal law enforcement and our companies behind of a few of the major indictments that you've seen in the news lately related to these uh, cyber attacks. We would not be successful if many of us did not have a PhD and did not conduct the art of a digital forensic science. So really thank you for uh, having us in today and share some of the stories from uh, our investigations. The pleasure is all mine, and I'm looking forward to some of those stories. Good cybersecurity practitioners are great storytellers, and I'm looking forward to hearing more. And of course, no session would be complete without a dynamic duo from Team Kaspersky. Much of you know them from previous sessions, so I'll just say a quick hello to them. Randall Richard and Kurt, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us and all your participation and sharing. Thus, without any further ado, we're going to jump into the discussion. I was talking a little bit about the VC ecosystem when it comes to ransomware, Andre, let's bring you into the conversation. Now you've made this observation on the VC ecosystem. Criminal gangs are investing in talent, diversifying their services, doing call for papers, conducting conferences around ransomware. You got alerted to this model of ransomware as a service and started studying it. In fact, you were even approached by a pretty prestigious university uh, to provide your commentary on what has been evolving in this ransomware as a service space. Can you shed some light on this for the next couple of minutes? Ali, it's something that we stumble on because just some of the individuals that we have seen, especially tracking money flow, the Bitcoin wallets, they're interconnected. So we were seeing criminals basically coming from 
very low ransom, like a ten, fifteen thousand dollars doing a little bit bigger in some, let's say in the six figures, 100, 20, 300, and coming into the million dollar market and, um, and see how that evolution uh, actually um, started. One great news about the Bitcoin is that you kind of understand the accounts and their value. That's something that we can replicate, let's say with the drug cartels, where we don't know the accounts, we have to find them, we have to look at the ML. So they actually, the ecosystem that uh, Bitcoin created is a great connector among these groups. And it's also a great connector how these individuals are getting paid and also understand the transactions. So what we've seen, for example, from the group though, going to uh, Zillowder to dark side is that some of the Bitcoins are literally carried over from some of those transactions. And they are used, for example, to pay for infrastructure. So, and there is a um, provider in Eurasia that you drop a few Bitcoins and they can actually procure AWS on Azure for you. It might cost you 10, 15% of a transaction, but truly you just literally, let's say, uh, nicely launder your Bitcoins for an infrastructure. Of course, uh, more and more, these wallets being followed by OFAC and federal law enforcement, meaning that if they enter exchange, all the amount would be busted. That's definitely not what something these this groups want to do. They often created now a very specific wallet that's only one time use and try to convert to currency like a Monero or something and disappear and then cash out. So getting the cash is very critical for, for the criminals. And it sparked that um, ecosystem of investors just virtue that it's impossible for them to cash up all the money. Some of the people don't wanna do that type of work anymore. Yet still own the Bitcoins and still are part of the system. So they truly just reinvest those Bitcoins for let's say pay for infrastructure of the new group and uh, what you saw, for example, in the dark side, a 20%, 10% proceedings comes to back as a payment. And that's your maybe, let's say, annual return on your investment, right? So as we say in a VC, money is always at a risk and investment is at a risk. So this is Bitcoin at a risk. So it can work with that 10, 20% being paid. But how do you know the groups, what the groups are really going to make? You, you don't really know. Right, so as, as you believe the people who are behind it, they gonna make a good impact, they, then ROI on that investment can be good. Uh, the challenging piece again is that once these coins coming in and they're being held almost like a hostage, then it just sparks more of these VC type of investments because they are not able to cash the money very quickly and, um, and basically move uh, spread among the groups. Also, right. the, another component in it, Ali, is that sure. it's not like people from outside, it's not like any of us here can actually get into the ecosystem. Usually, you do need to have a wallet that has been affiliated with some type of criminal activity. Right. So trust, like here, is very important. That's why we are all trusted here in one session. Trust is something very important among these groups as well, regardless, by the way, where they are. This is not country specific. This is activity specific. And these people, because they're good, they should know each other and they know how to assemble the proper team for the next mission. And also what we observed the last one, I was asked a question, what's the length of this group? Why, why do we see this ransom rotating? And I said, look, that if, if the ransom is funded, you should expect that the ransom is not gonna live within two, three more years. Meaning the specific version of ransomware is gonna disappear. And it's not because the threat actors wanna disappear. No, they actually rebrand themselves. It's almost like a VC fund in the U.S. is usually structured for seven years. And then you have to get a new round to pay the old fund. So what we see actually is this ecosystem of funding where, let's say in two, three years, the ransomware disappears completely. Sometimes on your view can be, well, it only existed for a year. Well, there's like a half a year preparation, half a year of cash, out, right? So it's a, it's a maturity that really matters in that fund. And then they cash out. They really go and do the accounting, what they earned. And they move to new rents or somewhere. Andrej, you've outlined that with such surgical precision. If someone was looking for a script for a new thriller, you've outlined it really, really well, Andre. I'm sure there are going to be more questions that come up. Thank you for that, uh, for that really intriguing introduction. Andre, I want to bring you into the conversation now, primarily because is it fair to say that it's not just large enterprise that needs to be concerned with ransomware as a corporation or ransomware as a service? In your work with SMBs, what types of ransomware attacks are you witnessing and how are you helping them? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we are definitely seeing smaller organizations become targets for ransomware. Uh, and we're coming, we're seeing them come in from a lot of the same threat vectors. Um, you know, when the pandemic happened and all our users kind of went home, all of a sudden we started to see a bit of a risk around our users. You know, are they going to click on those emails? Are they going to click on malicious links? And we're bringing that traffic back to our environments, um, our, our data centers. And so all of a sudden we had this big user threat vector. And then at the same time, we also had, you know, the evolution of our, of our traditional castle moat. And on the smaller organization side, we see a bit of a patchwork in terms of different security solutions from different point vendors, you know, and we've seen a loss of visibility. And due to the higher numbers of vulnerabilities that have come out in the last, uh, you know, year and a half, we're seeing a lot of them fall behind on this patching. And so all this on their network has become an increased threat vector as well. Uh, and so ransomware just becomes amplified for that. Um, so definitely overall as a whole, you know, it's not just a big organization who's being targeted. The model of ransomware as a service is so cost effective that you get a bigger spread and you can go after all the small guys. And due to sheer numbers, you know, you can actually get a, a lot of, uh, of victims that way. Thank you for that. And I really appreciate the fact that both uh, yourself and Andre, Andre at the start have really helped provide not just data around this subject, but context. And context is so important. So thank you for that introduction. And I invite you, if you have anything else to add, please interrupt me as we continue the discussion. Uh, I'm going to go to Kurt very quickly, because Kurt, I suspect that this question might emerge as we go through this discussion. And this has to do with the research and analysis that you're doing and the kind of trends and patterns that you're seeing in cryptographic practices. How sophisticated are some of these practices right now when it comes to ransomware? How immutable are some of these uh, encryptions that are being faced? Is paying the ransomware the only way out? Kurt? Yeah, so, um, so your first question about sort of trends and what we've seen with encryption strategies, uh, I would say that ransomware has been around for a long time, for a decade. And when we were sort of battling with ransomware in the first few years of it becoming a little more prevalent, uh, you could find encryption or you could find flaws in encryption strategies. You could recover keys. You could decrypt things for customers. This was technically a difficult thing to do, but something we were doing with regularity. Um, we even started a movement uh, that, that was behind um, not paying ransomware because we'd be able to provide keys and, and different strategies for decrypting files. Uh, over the past few years, really since 2019, uh, things have gotten quite a bit worse. Um, the technical implementation of ransomware uh, has become much more uh, professional. Um, there have been advances where we see them using a mix of AES, RSA, some of the newer um, encryption algorithms properly implemented. And when you take these you know, uh, proper implementations and you deploy them against small and medium businesses uh, and their infrastructures are configured properly and there isn't a way to recover these keys, uh, there are some real problems. So yeah, unfortunately, in the past couple of years, we've been seeing uh, advances in the encryption development, or I should say the development side of ransomware causing more problems. Uh, the second part of your question has to do with whether or not you pay, pay ransomware, or I mean, pay the ransom. And uh, there are a lot of folks who don't. Um, there are, there, I mean, we've been telling people don't pay the ransom don't pay the ransomware for years now. And, uh, you know, uh, backup and, and uh, restoration strategies um, can take care of this. And upfront investment and regular backups can, can really, really protect you or help in remediating this, remediating this issue, you know, any ransomware issue. Um, and keeping things patched, keeping things updated, you, you don't necessarily have to pay the ransom uh, but the problem over the past two years, at least on the ransomware side, is that we're seeing more and more code implemented properly. So if you don't have uh, really best practices in place, if you haven't prepared for this kind of event, which really you should, um, there you may have to pay the ransom. 
And uh, there are all sorts of conflicting messages that business leaders are getting about that. Um, you know, it even comes down to U.S. tax code. Is a ransom tax deductible? That's that's a real discussion right now. It shouldn't be, um, but it is. So business leaders are, and, and at the same time, insurance companies are beginning to say, we're not going to pay the ransom. Um, so now the business is on the hook, even if they have been paying their premiums on uh, cyber insurance. So um, on the technical side, again, professionally implemented stuff, uh, probably a result of this ecosystem that uh, Andre was just discussing. And uh, But there are all sorts of ways to deal with this up front and to keep these guys off of your systems. Thank you for that, Kurt. And you know, I really admire the, the emphasis that you placed on preparation and then knowing the context around ransomware. Bola said that if you're failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And I really like that emphasis. And we'll go into a little bit of this discussion. I've actually had one or two questions get DM'd to me. So I'll bring them up as we go along. Before I go to Randy, just to our audience very quickly, there are some nice little data points running through the ticker below. Also, periodically during the session, uh, one or two polls uh, will be shared. I'll, I'll let you know when those polls are being shared so that when they are shared, give us your responses and we'll try to weave them into the closing parts of our discussion. Randy, I want to bring you into the conversation because I know not only do you have probably much to offer and what's been said, but I want to draw you to a very specific question. When you look at recent exploits like the Colonial Pipeline attack, you know, it, it realizes everything that uh, our guests before you have said, it really underscores the complexity of these attacks. You're seeing not just complexities in terms of the technicality of the attack, the source of these attacks, but also when you look at how payments are being distributed. You're looking at networks of digital wallets and cryptocurrencies and an entire ecosystem that's pretty difficult to understand. Can you help us understand this complex networks and how are these payments being transferred locally and globally with very limited trace? Randy? Thanks, Ali. And you're right, the payment system you know, that's involved in these sort of transactions and you know, ransomware in general is really complex. And yeah, you know, that anonymity and the ability to move money quickly and easily le leverage cryptocurrency, uh, digital wallets, you know, definitely makes things easier for the cyber criminals. But the interesting thing is, you know, the cyber criminals who are selecting the targets and paying to launch these attacks don't really need to understand how all of that works. Right. You know, it's part of why ransomware as a service is such a rapidly growing problem and why we're talking about this specifically today. You know, ransomware as a service isn't just ransomware for sale. You know, think of it more as an end-to-end -end service offering uh, that has everything that an aspiring cyber criminal might need to get into the game. You know, with little or no technical skill, no business acumen, you know, th this includes providing them with training, tutorials, playbooks, toolkits, customer success agents, yeah, and all right through the payment processing. So um, these groups and organizations can even advise the new criminals on who to target and how much to charge for, for each of those targets. So um, this proliferation of, you know, as Kurt brought out, the higher quality deployments and proper implementation of ransomware that we're seeing where the attacks are more effective uh, in the scaling out, the going after more smaller to mid-size organization that Andrea is seeing over at Soft Choice. You know, those two things are kind of the bad news in this situation. But the good news is this model is also driving some standardization against across the tactics, techniques, and procedures that these groups are using. So although we're still dealing with targeted attacks that are customized for specific organizations and their environment, you know, we know what's in the bag of tricks that the criminals are using. So we can provide intelligence and tools that organizations that may have the highly skilled talent uh, on board uh, can use in order to quickly detect uh, this adversarial, adversarial activity. Or we can also provide uh, the services you know, that uh, smaller organizations with less sophistication, smaller teams on cybersecurity, that they would need also to, uh, to detect this sort of activity and uh, formulate a response. So. Yeah, you know, the key, key takeaway for all organizations really is that the volume is up and smaller organizations are now targets. So uh, we should all prepare accordingly. 
Randy, very, very important points. And uh, I think you recall there's some literature out there that when I introduced this session, where they talk about the of the idea that you know there was this belief that uh, you know ransom was sort of going away, um, but then they started noticing it's hitting more larger enterprises. But you're right, it's now again morphing into more attacks against smaller to medium enterprises that can literally get crippled by the ransom ask. So speaking about that, uh, I want to bring Andrea back into this conversation because that's her mission and her mantra, which is to help SMBs with staying protected and understanding this complex web. So Andrea, as best practices, A, what do you do to keep your clients aware and informed? And how do you advise them in terms of the steps that they need to take to be forewarned? Andrea? Absolutely. It, it starts with education. Um, you know, the easiest thing that any small business or any organization can really do uh, is to make sure they have a tested offline backup system, you know, that only connects to the network when they're doing those backups. Worst case, then you can just restore from your backup in the event, uh, event of a ransomware attack and is the easiest way to kind of get back on your feet. But you also want to make sure that, you know, you've got the right tools in place to detect these things. So making sure that you're leveraging, uh, you know, automated defense tools such as EDR or XDR, which focus on automated responses uh, either on the endpoint or the network. Uh, or even manage services. You know, if, if your team is not uh, comfortable with, with managing these types of attacks, maybe looking at managed services. Um, if you're moving heavily to the cloud, you know, a lot of organizations are looking at cloud native architecture, um, which may help modernize some of your data center uh, applications and make them at less risk for these uh, network-based attacks. But the key is really, you know, build and practice your remediation plan so, and make sure that you know you know, if you've got an incident response plan in place or a retainer that you're going to leverage through this. Um, you want to know basically who are you going to call in the event of an emergency or how are you going to deal with this? Because it is a very quick type of attack. Um, you can also look into ransomware simulations uh, and training just to make sure you're increasing awareness across all your employees from, you know, security awareness training to make sure your employees are not clicking on those nasty links and emails um, to making sure that your technical teams are enabled to know, hey, this is what it could look like in our environment. Here's the steps I need to remediate. Um, but it's really about having the right plan in place and testing it regularly. Now I'm reminded of the saying, right? Measure twice, cut once. Exactly. Uh, make sure your teams are well prepared. <laughs> and uh, telepathically, we're on the same page here. So I really, again, I really enjoyed the surgical precision with which you've actually articulated. And there are many directions in which you need to go, but you've, you're helping SMBs with defining a start line. And that, I think, is so crucial in the work that you do. So thank you for that. Before I go on to Andre and, uh, and ask him a question related to the operations of these ransom as a corporation. I just wanna alert our audience that in the next couple of minutes, you'll see a link to a little poll that will redirect you to a poll page. The first question that we're gonna ask you is, what are some of the ransomware events that you've heard of that have ended in a bit of a positive way for the good side of the community? So if you get a moment while you're listening to this, this session and enjoying it in the live chat, when you see that link, Click on it and your results will be fed to me. And towards the end, perhaps the last 10 minutes of our discussion, we'll start to unpack some of your responses. Andre, thank you for that. And Andre, I'm going to bring you back into the conversation. Now think about operations like DarkSight, all right, or similar operations that literally, for lack of a better word, have had a functional business operation. They've got team members in there. They're providing vacations. They're providing benefits. They're providing incentives. Is it just disruption that is motivating such organized activity or is it purely profit or is it both? And if you had to take out your crystal ball, what does the future look like for groups like this? What does their customer base look like going into the future? A tough one, Andre, but only you could answer this one. Ali, what we've seen uh, is that the threat actors are really good in right now profiling the entities they go after. And last two years, I would say from maybe 150 to 200 more significant intrusions that we've seen on ransomware side, almost all of them actually had pretty good cyber insurance programs. The threat actors, somehow it's uh, highly suspected and last year almost 300 insurance carriers and brokers have been compromised meaning that the data for premiums and data for limits of these institutions are kind of no. So for example, if I tell you I'm in New York City and I pay, pay $10,000 for my error and omission cyber, you probably understand what my limit is. And um, 
it, these are also competitive spreadsheets. Like anyone who from us worked in the marketing or sales knows that you get a spreadsheet with you know, emails and phone numbers, and you probably don't ask a lot of questions. How did you got that from? And what are you going to do with it? It's just the reality is that these um, the ecosystem right now is very heavily focused that the targets are picked carefully and they are not random targets. They're targets that can pay. These uh, gangs right now, if you look at like a dark operation, they have affiliates where they basically purchase this type of target list. So they have to pay for them. It's not like a freebie, but these marketing lists are for sale and ransomware and they do need to pay for them. It's not something probably that any of the groups has in-house capabilities. We've seen some of the brokers, for example, carriers uh, potentially being compromised. You've seen CNA, you've seen AXA in the news. So some of them you've seen in the news, but the list is over 300 that, that basically have been confirmed to communicate to botnet, like a C2C control channel that basically can exfiltrate the data from these institutions. So it's a really large set. The first modus operandi of this group is truly pick up their targets. Pick someone who can pay, it's very important. Like why would you want to rob the house that's empty or it's going to fall on you when you open a door? So the, the groups, really, they're really good and pick the targets. Second one is that the groups like, a, like the dark side, and it's not dark side specific. I don't think that's their invention. The groups are looking for something what they call the third-party liability. And third-party liability is an effect where uh, a third-party, let's say like a Kaseya, has a software has MSSPs and has customers. So these customers are now third party liability to Kaseya because through MSSPs as a delivery vehicle is being delivered to their customers. So trade actors are very highly confident they're gonna get paid because the third party liability is much higher than the uh, actual ransom they're asking. If you look at the Colonial, a uh, few of the stories that circulated again in the news may might need to be validated on and around 200 to 150 million was an estimate if the data on a dark web have been released as a third party liability to Colonial. Compared to 5 million ransom, probably nothing. And then internally, what we've seen this group, um, same with like a dark side to do is, they just create a lot of havoc. Why? Because people get very busy internally and they don't have a chance to deal with anything else. This is no different than a highly military unit puts the C4 on the door, kicks the door, blow a few silencers, right? And uh, blow a few uh, uh, camouflage smoke into the building. And basically you have a hard time to clean the building for two, uh, two months. And that's what happens. All the departments are busy. It, it reckons the infrastructure. Everyone is super tied up and people can't really pay attention as much as they would like to do anything else. The legal departments and forensic firms are basically now tasked with the third party liability establishment of the data exfiltration and what really happened. Um, and that's been the game that's been played, I would say for the last two years. And uh, that's a very typical modus of operandi. So now how is this really supported? Look, that ecosystem of funding created phenomena where these people can get really well paid, meaning that people can get paid some serious money to do a cybercrime. Chance is being extradited today from some of the places is slim to nothing. Chance is to be uh, potentially a target of a drone. Uh, you know, it's still under maybe two to three percent. I mean, there are not a lot of places that they're going to allow you to fly the drone over the other territory, right? And and bomb other nation. I mean, it, it does happen in the news and hits the news, but. Reality of some drone coming in and do something, uh, it's also very slim. So some of these threat actors are basically saying, look, this became a business. As long as we use ecosystem of a hate among the nation, and it had nothing to, by the way, related to the countries it's coming from, they just truly love that ecosystem of a hate. As long as that exists, there are no cooperations of the law enforcement in the countries that don't perhaps like each other the most this is going to work because now you have almost like safe harbor for the groups that going from being a programmer, going to a small ransomware manager, going to a CEO of operation and ransomware, now becoming an investor and now have other people to do the, all the jobs for me, uh, what I used to do. Uh, this, is, this is what is really happening. And that's the evolution of the last seven eight years that we've seen. And that's why ransom also went from $10,000, $15,000 to millions right now. 
Right. These guys are attacking with a military precision. It's really scripted. It's really thought through. Has some business logic, right? Okay, I don't pick up the targets I can pay. I pay the third party liability. I have my targets. I hire the top talent. Look at the exploit using Kaseya, chain exploit. That's something that intelligence agencies have been doing 10 years ago. It was a secret weapon. Chain exploit term was not even declassified, right? Meaning that authenticate, upload the file, command and control to the system. Uh, so they're really using state of the art, almost like a military grade deployment uh, against these enterprises. So the chances of uh, not being a target or, or survive are getting slimmer. And usually I'll tell everyone that, um, look, there's nothing wrong. There might be nothing wrong with what you're doing. Once you're a target, you are a target. If a sniper is focusing on you, he will shoot the bullet. He will either kill you or he'll miss you. It's just the way it works. And it says it's not something you can prevent, that cyber sniper not being close to you. We live in an ecosystem that cyber warfare is realistic. People see it, replicating it, and each of us is going to be touched from maybe cyber call to cyber cancer. Life is a breach. This is a reality. Uh, so, um, you know, you just have to get ready. You just have to get ready. Like in your life, you can't say what you're going to get, and you might be treated by over-the-counter to uh, some very uh, fancy prescriptions that you need. But those ring and their modus operandi going to touch you. And um, the way they're recruiting people right now, the talent they have, like you said, the vacation packages, benefits, uh, extra Bitcoin, some cash. Um, it, it truly creates an ecosystem where normal person could not make in a 10 years, 15 years. Yep. Right? So being in that ecosystem in two, three years, high risk, high reward, is very appealing to many. I think you've, you've spoken about it so well. And I really like the fact that, you know, the emphasis that you placed on data. I say this all the time. Data will talk to you if you're willing to listen to it. You've definitely been listening to the data quite a bit. And I just want to work with that. Two other questions have come to me, Andre, which I'll come to towards the latter end. But Kurt, if I can bring you into this conversation, and I want to give our audience a sense of scale and size. Andrea has done a phenomenal job telling organizations where they need to start from. Randy has unpacked the complexity of these attacks. Andre has spoken about the nature of the VC and the ecosystem. Can you give our audience a sense of the scale and the volume of the kind of data that is now being moved through illegal means as a result of some of these attacks? Kurt? Yeah, for sure, Ali. Um, so uh, one of the additional tactics that these ransomware groups have added to their bag of tricks is uh, sort of a dub they double dip in coercing their victims to pay the ransom. So not only do they tie up your data and disrupt your network by encrypting everything on it, but in the meantime, before they've encrypted it, for weeks they may spend uh, some time here and there uh, pulling all of your communications, all of your accounting files, all of your customer records off of your network and storing them in their cloud. Um, and the data we're talking about, the, num the sorts of numbers can, any can be anywhere, usually from tens of gigabytes to uh, hundreds of terabytes. And uh, unfortunately, small and medium businesses have, you know, they have uh, cloud resources, they have high speed networks, uh, these criminals, once they're in these networks, they can move data in very large amounts uh, very quickly that they weren't able to even a few years ago. Um, and so like these amounts of data are sitting out there. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting. A lot of the time this is sitting out there on the Tor network and um, a recent upgrade to Tor from version two to version three has actually disrupted some of the uh, infrastructure that I've been watching this past week. Um, Tor v2 has been deprecated for Tor v3. So I kind of, I don't know, I see here and there some disruptions with their own networks, but they're serving up uh, pretty extreme amounts of data publicly in order to force uh, ransom out of these customers, whether or not you've backed up. So in addition to having backup and restore capabilities, you also really want to prevent um, 
uh, not only a, a foothold and cobalt strike and all sorts of things being deployed on your network, but you want to be able to see whether or not data is being moved out of your network in the amount of terabytes. So that may alert you to something, uh, to a presence in your network that you just do not want. You know, they don't say it without reason that data is the, the new liquid gold, uh, and it is really an prized asset that we need to be protecting. So, Kurt, again, one or two questions that have emerged from this, and I'll also go to the poll, and we'll discuss that very shortly. Um, Randall, if I can bring you back into the conversation, or as I like to call you, Captain Randy, um, I need to ask you this question because I think it draws a little bit on what you spoke about earlier on. When you look at the evolution of digital wallets and cryptocurrencies uh, and this ability to move funds in new innovative ways, do you feel that these have accelerated the kind of ransomware activities and the motivations to engage in such activities? Your perspective? Yeah, when you think of cryptocurrencies, they're really just the latest tool that criminals are using to you know, distribute and launder the profits that they've gained from their illegal activities. And to me, it's just the modern spin on that briefcase full of unmarked bills that we saw in all those crime dramas in the 70s or 80s. Um, but having this rolled into ransomware as a service platforms means that as these uh, threat actors who are really service providers find new ways to move money around that's, that's you know, safer, more discreet, uh, more able to keep anonymous, you know, their customers are going to benefit and automatically adopt these method, methods as part of that service. And you know, I think we will continue moving forward to see proliferation, but you know, interestingly, you know, at least one of the major players in ransomware as a service has recently gone dark. You know, presumably uh, some folks have kind of speculated that because some of their very high profile attacks that, that have been attributed to them have captured the attention of some heads of state and you know, there are diplomatic conversations happening around that now. Uh, they think that uh, this potentially is why uh, this particular group you know, has quieted down. So. You know, as we see this proliferation, you know, in order to stay profitable yet out of the headlines, I think we're going to see a more concerted effort to target smaller organizations. So, you know, those those SMB organizations that we've been talking about, you know, the smaller enterprise organizations, you know, they're they're going to have to take steps to prepare themselves. You know, and based on some of the uh, engagements that we've had in the first half of this year, you know, we're definitely seeing that increase of targeted adversarial activity in organizations that, um, you know, uh, two years ago, you really wouldn't have uh, expected it. Uh, and that's kind of validating this, this theory that we've kind of put out there. So the counter move that we're advising those that we consult with is to you know, strategically focus on the timely detection of adversarial activity and having that playbook in place that Andrea spoke about, whether you know, it's an IR service or your own team you know, taking uh, incident response uh, in their own hands, you know, being ready for this type of thing. Um, and we at Kaspersky, you know, Soft Choice and uh, LifeRs as well, we're all in a position to uh, help any organization that's concerned about that and want to make sure that they uh, have the steps in place. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know what, me and you have had many uh, conversations about what's driving certain trends, future predictions, and you've always been spot on. If only you would get the lotto numbers right for me and then we would be <laughs> the best of friends. But absolutely, very well articulated there, uh, Randy. And I just want to work with that to bring one question that's come into the, uh, from the audience. Thank you to the audience member that brought this up. Andre, as expected, this question is uh, directed to you and I'll reword it just a little bit. Is these organized groups that function in ransomware as a corporation or ransomware as a service, how are they going about finding not only their targets, but their clients. I guess to put it in more business terms, how are they going and getting leads and marketing their services? Okay. So finding the targets is truly, it seems like the insurance lists have been prevalent for last maybe two years. Like the, the trade actors definitely don't want to hit a company they can't pay. So having that company just being on the internet and being there and not having ability to pay not from their pockets is not something that threat actors really want. So unfortunately, so your, so your cyber insurance makes, it's look, it's, you have to face reality, it's available, it's sellable, people know what you paid for, probably how much insurance you have. 
um, and they will target you and they understand what that limit is. Um, secondly, the portion of that question, why, why they will be a target is that once they see the insurance is there, they're looking, is there, is there any good third party liability angle here when they do the data mm -hmm. exfiltration that it would be. Just having employee data is kind of nice, but it doesn't serve the purpose. It has to be really like a partner ecosystem that would be hammered here where someone could potentially bring a litigation or it should be an anticipation of litigation against that entity. That's something what they really like. So that third party liability, ability to pay, um, that, that's great. And then look at how well is this guarded? I mean, are we trying to get to the four knocks or are we trying to get to some normal enterprise? And um, if they can, they're gonna do like they did in Colonial. They come through right through the front door through VPN as authorized user. And you're gonna have a hard answer question like how did they got the username and password? But we've seen basically coming in like right through the main door, like a barbarians at the gate, coming right through the main, main door, uh, pretending they're a user, looking like a user and um, um, uh, I basically people people write in uh, into it. Interesting. I just want to hold that thought for a moment because of two more questions that have come in, which I'll come to you a little bit later on. Kurt, if I can bring you into this conversation, uh, just to talk a little bit about another question that has come in, and that is about source of these attacks and focusing more on mobile ransomware. Um, are you seeing that that is more in a decline? What are some of the trends that you're looking at when it comes to mobile related ransomware? Kurt? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I would say that the mobile ransomware that we had been seeing um, is is on the decline we compare as a portion of the overall ransomware attacks that we've we've been seeing in the wild. So that's that's definitely on the decline. We're seeing sort of a spread to Linux. Um, to other operating systems from Windows. It's not just a Windows problem anymore. Um, so that's an issue. But when it comes to the targeted attacks, they're certainly looking at servers, at workstations, and not so much at the mobile platforms. Okay. And I think uh, this also says a lot in terms of the data that's available to the audience. If you go onto the Kaspersky site, uh, there's quite a lot of information and white papers that you can read specific on uh, the decline in certain aspects of ransomware. And, and I will get someone from the team to also drop some of those really informative links in the live chat. Now to our audience member, one poll has already been completed. There's a second poll that has been shared as well. I'll go to Andrea first, we'll go to Randy, and then we'll go back to Andrea and Kurt. And Kurt will unpack some of the poll responses with you. Andrea, when it, um, again, a question, which I'll reword just a little bit, is that when you are working with uh, your clients, and this is a question that we also asked in the poll, what, uh, how do you guide them in terms of some best practices around ransomware prevention that have a, a good ROI? So in the poll results that we have, you know, it's a 50-50 split. Um, some people see updating and patching externally exposed web services as their first primary activity that has a good ROI from a ransomware protection perspective. And the other one says, you know, running full endpoint security reviews and bug detection, so on and so forth. What would you say are some practices that have the most ROI when it comes to ransomware prevention? Absolutely. Uh, we've actually seen a, a neat trend happen in the last kind of year where organizations that have a lot of uh, transformation on their roadmap, so they want to do a lot more in the cloud, they want to modernize their applications and leverage the cloud, are actually moving to cloud native frameworks. So they're moving away from their traditional networks into like a SASE, uh, like a cloud SASE yeah. model in order to start reducing that risk. Because if their users are working from home anyway, there's actually a less business need to start, you know, to keep that backhauling going. So we're starting to see a bit of uh, architectural changes happen with our customers where they're starting to figure out, you know, does it make sense for me to, to start consolidating my network tools into a, a full comprehensive platform that will give me the visibility outwards in a hybrid mode? Or if I'm not gonna keep my, my legacy environment around, what does the cloud version look like of that? So right. this is really changing because it's a board level conversation now. It's really forcing them to say, are we still you know, in a, in a mode where we can deal with if ransomware comes in or is this the catalyst, uh, catalyst that's moving us to a new type of architecture? 
interesting. And I think, you know, to the audience member, again, for those who asked that question and those who responded to the poll, you can keep your questions and answers into that poll system going until the end of this session. And if you have more questions, please reach out to our, our panelists. You can find them, um, you know, reach out to the team at Kaspersky and you'll get their details or just reach out directly to me and I'll be happy to connect you. Thank you for all, all of you for your questions. I have one more question and then we'll probably come to about the last 12 minutes of our discussion. Randy, this one is for you. And again, I'll reword it just a bit because it wouldn't be a session with me if I didn't throw in my two rupees of thought. Uh, Randy, when it comes to now, when the conversations around ransomware protection, proactive discussions around ransomware, you know, someone like yourself and having worked with you very closely, you know, multiple discussions, multiple organizations, different strokes or different folks, are you finding it challenging now switching gears in your conversation? You're speaking one way with the technical folks, but now when it comes to ransomware discussions, you need to speak to legal, you need to speak to finance, you need to speak to admin. How is that coming about for you? And how are you finding it in terms of translating the impact of ransomware to different groups within an organization? Randy? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Ali. Um, and I think helping people understand the, the true threat now and why things are different now than before is, uh, is really the key when you transition the conversations you know, from the folks who are working within the, the security organization you know, to the boardroom, the, the people who are setting the budgets, because you know, I believe that um, I haven't talked to anybody who isn't on the, who's on the front lines that doesn't understand this shift. You know, they're seeing that increase in activity. You know, they're seeing um, you know, the, the small indications that, they're, uh, that their environment is being tested and, and evidence of uh, potential adversarial behavior. Um, and the folks are, are concerned, uh, but it's really helping the, the folks in the boardroom understand the change and why this change has happened now that is the key. And, you know, it's really, um, I'm thankful that we have some of these uh, high profile incidents you know, that are getting uh, international attention, a lot of press coverage, you know, it's part of, you know, the cultural conversation that we're having. So I think, um, you know, the, the real implications are starting to get a, come across, but, you know, it's really being able to tell those stories, you know, explain, you know, what the average cost of an incident response is, um, you know, in the short term or in the long term, if something, you know, if uh, an adversary was able to work within the environment for an extended period of time, how much more difficult that would be. So, you know, that's really the key to the conversation. But the fact that ransomware kind of has the, the culture's attention right now, you know, definitely makes things helpful for us. Very interesting. And, and, and I really emphasize and I appreciate the way in which, you know, you don't just emphasize what you're talking about when it comes to answer, but who you're talking about and knowing how to translate that information. This is why I really subscribe to a lot of the, the feeds that many of you had shared in preparation for this session. And uh, to the audience, if you're looking for more readings, et cetera, just let us know in the live chat and someone from the team, uh, especially Kaspersky, will share some links with you. We've got another 10 odd minutes left and we do have a concluding question. I do want to come to the final poll as well and unpack it a little bit with Kurt. Uh, Andre, I got this question as well, and this has to do, I expected this one to come in with regards to the pandemic. Um, we know that as the data has shown us since 2020, a huge acceleration in ransomware activities. Has the pandemic uh, in your research realized any forms of discounts when it comes to ransomware? Are these ransomware as a service actors showing some form of kindness when it comes to how they're targeting their victims? Has the pandemic reshaped any of those activities and how they're demanding ransom, Andre? It is a sector, meaning that perhaps, let's say, ransomware early, early they decided we'll leave the first responders out of the mix and maybe we'll leave the hospitals. But there is some level of kindness. But also what happened at the same time, ransomware prices increased dramatically in ransomware. Right? We, we see the like early stages of six, seven figures, I would say two years ago. Now in pandemic, it's, it's pretty much any more formidable group, it's all about seven figures. So pandemic really helped them to focus. Uh, many of these individuals, perhaps, one of the theories that had very different lifestyle. So for example, one of the individuals we were tracking um, in a block, a former block that I came from, uh, had uh, two girlfriends, two Porsche cars, and 
you know, it's like a, kind of like a hard to maintain the style to keep them separated, keep them happy, mm-hmm. you know, Christmas gifts. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of interactions going on. And I guess when pandemic hit, it, it, these people were nailed to just one lifestyle. They couldn't do the two lifestyles anymore. And they have to be more honest about their own lifestyle. Um, and that brings a lot of free time in their hands uh, that I can use now into the production and master the skills. So what I would say the pandemic really created a mastership or craftsmanship in ransomware. How the attacks are being perpetrated, how the trade actors can focus on targets, how they get into the networks. They really thought this more true and allowed them basically to refocus and reshape their businesses, their models, which uh, without a pandemic and whole world being able to travel and enjoy the lifestyle and do anything uh, would not be possible for them, right? So shifted them to focus. At the same time, most of the corporation, regardless of what they say, they were not ready to deploy everyone remote, meaning they did not have even hardware to scale some of the companies, not even hardware in the early era to VPN or people in. And how would they VPN them in? It's just the reality. Imagine you have 30,000 employees, you build in a capacity that at any point of a time, 20, 30% of your workforce comes remote, now 100% goes remote. And imagine the security channels and the flows that security measures that you need just when everyone is coming from this one gate, which is called remote gate right now. The main door and everything that you had before, forget about that. It doesn't exist almost like anymore. It's hardly any traffic, hardly has any traffic from you. So that also helped them to these threat actors basically to be more targeted on how they're gonna operate and how they're gonna target these companies. Allow them that not having very well defined perimeter at a company, but all these people now became a perimeter to the company. It's not defined anymore what that is. Uh, and having like what I call sometimes split tunneling where one goes to internet, one goes to company because the company can't handle truly at the beginning that flow, right? And obviously this policy is really tightening up, but everything has to go through company. Everything's gonna get inspected, right? But that, again, I mean, most of the companies, I would say half of the, half of the businesses still can't do it. Right, and you're talking like a really larger, mid-sized type of enterprises between two, three to 10,000 users, right? Mm-hmm. It's the, the, the architecture just does not support it. So this is um, um, quite a significant challenge which basically allows these trade actors to be much uh, more affordable uh, in the market and allow these trade actors to be much more successful and tactical in their missions. Yeah, you know, there were a few points that were also made around the motivations to join some of these groups, what gets folks recruited into them, some of the geographical spread. And, and absolutely, there is uh, only that, you know, the, the, the arms of time are letting go because we only have about five more minutes left. But I'm sure that at a later time, we can dive deeper into some of those discussions. Kurt, um, one of the poll questions had to do with, uh, you know, selecting at least two ransomware events that ended, if you will, in a slightly positive return. And when I looked at the results, about 42% looked at uh, the TrickBot malware and the author of the TrickBot malware getting arrested as that is a very highly positive result. Uh, and another one about Revo going dark in uh, July, 2021. So from your perspective, how do these positive outcomes emerge? And why do you think our audience focused on these two as uh, two really seminal moments when it comes to a change in the landscape uh, when it comes to ransom as a service? Kurt? Yeah, well, um... One thing we didn't really discuss all that much were, was the um, the interconnected nature of these ransomware groups and the access brokers that are out there. So access brokers, um, at least from what we've been seeing through the epidemic, they kind of shifted their tactics a bit. TrickBot and the TrickBot module authors happen to be uh, one of the access brokers, or at least for one particular group, they gained access uh, for a ransomware group, but um, they shifted towards targeting VPN concentrators, RDP uh, equipment, because people are working from home and they need remote access. So we did see a bit of a shift there and um, and impacting an, an access acquisition um, uh, portion of these operations is a big deal because if they don't have easy access to uh, a target list, um, 
they can't they can't carry out the ransomware operation. So that may be one reason why the audience had heard of and knows about that particular TrickBot malware author. Also, it's very unusual for someone to be traveling like that and extradited um, and indicted on charges uh, related to to these larger and better known operations. Um, the reveal uh, the reveal event is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, they were a sort of they had high profile events recently. They are the ones who got into Kaseya. They are the ones who have impacted, I, I forget if it's over a thousand organizations. I think it's in the hundreds of organizations uh, around the world because they got into an MSSP. And then from there, they were able to uh, get into customers of the MSSP. So the impact of that is huge. And they go, if the group goes dark, um, not only their sort of their payment processing site, their um, support site, their, their support people on various underground forums have gone dark and they, they aren't talking or responding to requests. Um, that's a big deal because it leaves organizations that have encrypted networks um, just in the, like, they're, they're stuck. So um, the, the, the volume and the scale of, the, of their activity has been huge very recently. Uh, so that's another reason why that one's really interesting. Absolutely. And thank you for helping us unpack those polling numbers as well. And I feel that, you know, the audience members that are joining in, if you, if you haven't yet, you know, send us your, uh, your votes on both of those polls that have been posted up in the live chat. And we'll be happy to unpack that even offline and perhaps share some additional commentary. Now, we've got about four minutes left. And I want to come to one concluding question, which I'll go to each one of you, and then we'll come to a bit of a soft landing. Now, I know that they say the best way to produce, uh, to predict the future is to create it. Uh, but not in this case, because I don't want you to create these scenarios, but I do want to think, I want you to put your thinking hats on and tell me, if you had to look into the future, where do you see ransomware headed towards? What are some of the changes you're expecting to see? Kurt, we'll start off with you. Yeah, um, so the, the ransomware itself, again, has been produced in, a, it, there have been advances in the encryption tactics within the malware itself. Um, because of the amount of money and talent that's being attracted to these groups, uh, I would say, unfortunately, um, these, this malware, and we're already seeing this, is going to be quicker, it's going to perform better, and the encryption is going to continue to be reliable for the ransomware authors and for, unfortunately, for the operators. So um, that in itself is a huge problem. Um, ransomware will become, yeah, more efficient, more effective, and it's unfortunately technically going to advance in the next few years. Kurt says it's going to get technically more advanced and more challenging, meaning we'll need more skills at the table. Andrea, your perspective on what do you see in the not so distant future? I, I think we're going to see a shift in the model. I think uh, now that we understand ransomware and these types of services really go after the networks, I think we're going to see a, a response where we see a lot of organizations move cloud native. And once we start eliminating that threat vector, I'd be curious to see if we start to see the bad actors start evolving their tactics to do you know, ransomware and things like that for cloud native environments, kind of this cat, cat and mouse. Absolutely. They say never trust a computer you can't throw out of the window, but that has changed as a result of the pandemic. And I'd agree with you there on your predictions as well. Captain Randy, you've never got this wrong. Don't disappoint. Uh, your predictions for the future. Yeah, for what I think, um, the only way we're going to see ransomware slow down is if we make it harder, therefore more expensive to execute. Um, and we could potentially do that with better technology. You know, thinking of you know, my past experience on fraud prevention, you know, as soon as chip and pin came in, all of a sudden the, the carding schemes got more difficult. So uh, fraudsters had to shift their focus. So you know, if we have some sort of leap in technology that makes uh, ransomware more expensive and, and the, um, the likelihood of success uh, to decrease, 
I could see that slowing it down. I think the other piece, which is more likely or, or I'm more hopeful about, I should say, is if we increase the risk of consequences for these bad actors. And what that's really going to take is um, you know, concerted effort uh, from you know, international law enforcement, um, you know, more attention paid to attribution, and then really um, you know, working together to stop uh, these threat actors and kind of stopping this practice of having privateers you know, threat actors that um, that countries let operate within their borders, you know, with just kind of a wink and a smile. Very well said. The best form of defense is attack. And if we can attack with more powerful technology, I think the metaphor, rather not even the metaphor, the example of the chip technology, it's a very good example. And I really appreciate also the little uh, mention that you made about geographical borders and nation state actors, which I'm sure could be a subject for another discussion. Mandy has always surgically precise Andre, you got us interested in this topic. I'll give you the closing comments. The future, what does your crystal ball tell you? Look, you like it or not, you will be touched in a cyberspace. Just the reality. Okay, you were born, you will be deceased. In between, somehow you're going to be hacked. Just life is a breach. It's just how bad this- it's going to be from mild cold to really bad cancer. You just don't know. And how quickly can you detect it? And how can we can you eradicate? But it's going to happen. And extortion will scale down to individual level. Why? Because it's effective. I guarantee you, everyone who's listening right now has something they didn't tell their mom by age of 15. It's just the way it is. Right? The threat actors are looking for that data, for that intelligence that would be at that level. It also will lure a lot of kids, literally just kids out of Eurasia, for example, Eurasia Pack, maybe African countries, whatever, where, you know, $500,000, $3,000 makes a really meaningful pay. So mm-hmm. scaling to that level, I saw, saw one, for example, very interesting here on a QNAP device. Again, not picking out a vendor, but encrypting QNAP, getting into the cloud of the provider, and then encrypting all home devices, right, and asking just a few thousand dollars. And these are suspected to be really kids just doing this type of work, right? Really getting some understanding of what that actually is. So I think it will scale down as a cyber extortion in general. It will scale down almost to everything. The bigger rings, because now there's money in and it's already heavily invested. Uh, When money are invested, when things are at stake, that business has to go. So I don't see this group basically stopping. It's like a stopping drug cartels. We will have to go and declare the war. We will have to use offensive forces. If you look at what happened in a Pablo Escobar, we had to go there and actually do something. Uh, that's what you may be seeing right now, uh, offensive military forces being used, like let's say picking up the uh, crypto wallet, uh, public uh, and private key uh, from some of these individuals. Um, maybe that's, that's the future, right? So on the high criminal end side, offensive forces that nations will declare this as a cyber terrorism and uh, motions of the various governments will declare it as a cyber terrorism and they will be able to use this type of forces to stop, to not to stop it by basically going and intervene with the straight actor overseas. Um, and then on a personal side, I think it's going to get ugly. The same way the credit card fraud existed, what Randy mentioned here before, everything else is going to get really ugly before it's going to get better. Very, very interesting points that are brought up by Andre and, you know, that mention of Pablo Escobar, you know, I think, you know, without even being facetious about it, that line, plata or plomo, is something that I think is what Andre is saying is what the future might look like. So we do have to, as Andre had mentioned, be proactive in our approach, measure twice, cut once. As Kurt mentioned, you need to be looking at the data, you need to be understanding the data and what's happening. You need to have folks like Randy at the table to help you unpack what is it that you're looking at and how you can prepare your defenses. Andre, Kurt, Andre, Randall, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to ask you to stay on so that we can just debrief very quickly uh, in the green room for about 30 seconds. But to our audience, thank you all for joining us today. The next episode for the In The Note session will be announced very, very shortly. And I'll be pleased to welcome you to that session as well. And the team from Kaspersky will reach out to you with registrations. I've learned a lot in this session today. But as they say in Canada, the medium is the message. And it's not just about ransom, but how ransomware, but how is it being executed on? What's the medium? And I hope today you enjoyed the way in which our panelists unpack that medium. I hope and trust that all of you stay safe, stay healthy, 
and also use the remainder of the summer time to relax, rejuvenate, and rethink some of your cybersecurity strategies. I hope you find time to take some time to do some more reading uh, and to do some more analysis, but also enjoy and relax yourselves. If you're looking for something to do and have no idea, get the family and friends together and watch an episode of In The Node because there will be recordings available and that will be shared to you by the team from Team Kaspersky. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon or from wherever in the world that you're joining us. Thank you for joining in. Stay safe, stay healthy. On behalf of In The Node and Team Kaspersky, this is Ali Hirji signing off. Take care.